2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, don't listen to the scoffers. It's easy to be derailed, discouraged. Don't listen to that which would discourage you. We'll look at the first seven verses. This is Second Peter 3. 1 through 7. Hear God's word. Now this is the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and the Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. This is God's word for us. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we read of a reminder of the day of judgment coming. We desire for our hearts to be ready daily. We desire, too, for more to know and to come to Christ. Open our hearts that we would be encouraged to be looking for your coming. We pray this. In Jesus' name, amen. Samuel Johnson was the fellow who wrote the dictionary. It was it James Bosworth did a, a biography of him. And, and one of the things they said about him was he never rewrote anything. And I was told by my teachers, uh, yeah, but you're not, you're, you're no Johnson. You, you write, rewrite stuff. We rewrite things because they need to. Anyway, one of his pithy sayings was this. It's not sufficiently considered that men may more frequently be required to be reminded than to be informed. Men may more frequently be required to be reminded than to informed. As a teacher and a preacher, my job is not to merely present you with new facts or new ideas about understanding the scripture, but to tell what it says and remind you of what is important. I remind you of what you already know. I remind myself of what I already know. I give no excuse for this because that's the main thing I am to do. Make it plain. Make no apology for the fundamentals of the faith because without the fundamentals, we don't have the faith. It's important. We lose our focus. As they say, we lose the plot. Keep the main thing, the main thing. Keep the first thing, the first thing. In that great resurrection chapter, and this is a chapter not describing or giving the account of the resurrection, but St. Paul, who talks about what it means, this is 1 Corinthians 15, he says these are the things that were of first importance. And he goes over and he says, what people need to hear. Now the problem in that chapter and the problem in this chapter is the same one. Jesus is coming back, but people are saying, well, maybe he's not. Maybe there is no resurrection. Maybe there isn't anything beyond this. Maybe our loved ones, they're just gone. And this is a great concern that they'd have. What if Jesus comes back and they're not here? Will they miss out? 
What if Jesus comes back and I'm not here? Will I miss out? These are the things that were being said and wondering. Paul took, takes up this topic in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 also. And he says, I don't want you to grieve like those who have no hope. I mean, it's, the, the Lord is going to return. Just as he left, he's coming back. It'll be with a, the loud shout and the trump and the archangel. And he'll come and he'll be in the clouds with all those who have died first. And we're not going to go ahead of them. They will be with Christ and then we will be caught up to be with them. And then we will ever be with the Lord. The last line of that is comfort each other with these words. Tell each other these things that you're not grieving as those who have no hope. You're secure in Christ. Your loved ones are in Christ. Comfort one another. Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul deals with the resurrection there because people are saying, well, there is no resurrection. And he's saying, "Uh, wait a minute, that's awfully hurtful to people who have lost their loved ones, but even more, you're losing the main plot of the gospel. Because if there's no resurrection, then Jesus didn't get raised. And if Jesus is getting raised, we ought to all go home. There's nothing here for us if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, and he did. I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you stand, and by which you're being saved if you hold fast to the thing which I preached to you, or else you believed in vain. Compare that to the first couple of verses of our text as well. This is the second letter I'm writing to you. In both of them, I'm stirring you up by a sincere way of reminding that you'd remember the predictions of the holy prophets. That stirring up, this is what Paul was doing in 1 Corinthians 15. This is what Peter is doing here. The emphasis is to remind them what they already knew. Remember what you knew. Remember what you believed. You don't need more information. You need to be rooted in this information. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance to the scripture, and on the, he was buried and he was raised again in the third day in accordance with the scripture, and then he was seen by the twelve and up to five hundred at a time. Is it important that Jesus rose from the dead? Yes, it is of first importance, the heart of the gospel. When people are assaulted by grief, they need the gospel because it reminds us of God's love. The sweet words of the gospel. When I lead a memorial service, I remind all of us that we're here to worship God. And we're worshiping God with an object lesson of our own mortality. They have passed. We will too. If the Lord doesn't return, we will die as well. The people who hear need to have the comforting words of the gospel concerning their loved one. But as we consider our own death, we need the comforting words of the gospel. Jesus said to his disciples, in my father's house are many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you. If it wasn't true, I would have told you. It is true. And I'm going there that where I am, you may be also. This is the gospel. This helps our own thinking. It also tunes our heart when we hear these basic things to delight in the things of the Lord. We won't be pulled away by those who would be scoffing or those who are are doubting, but we will be delighting in the things of Christ. So never be ashamed of the basics. There are people that want to get past the basics to get to the deep things of the faith. Remind them, the basics are the deep things of the faith. The gospel is the word of life. What did Paul say there in Romans? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and also for the Gentiles. Here is this gospel that's laid out. This gospel of, of grace by faith unto faith in Christ. So remind yourself. Remind one another. This is what we speak of. Let the things of God 
crowd out other things, lesser things, things that would draw you away from the Lord. Be proactive on the things of God. Feed your heart on the things of God. Or else you'll find they'll, other things will crowd it out. It will crowd out the things of God. Have your mind stirred up by the things of God. This is what Peter's saying. I want to stir you up in this. By the way, this is one of the advantages of special services, special conferences. Some of our people are going to a special conference in Florida. And I'm always amazed there are special things for me to go to as a pastor. And I'll, I'll go and I think, this is wonderful. I should really go. And my elders say, you know, you really need to go. It's great. You come back and, and there's, there's, there's more, I don't know, zeal or whatever it is, but there's some good stuff. Plus, I can teach some of the things I just learned and, and things I'm integrating. But it's important to do. And that's not to disparage the weekly gathering for worship because that's the steady diet. We gather in the Lord's day with God's people to hear the word of life, a spiritual meal we share together. We have our own Bible reading. We have Bible reading with friends. We have Bible studies. We encourage one another. But without this, we starve spiritually. Christians are not to neglect that basic meeting together. That does lead to spiritual atrophy. And, and that's the theme of the book of Hebrews. What's the big theme of the book of Hebrews? Jesus is the way. Jesus is the better way. Jesus is the only way. Don't look for another way. This is the best way. This is the only way. Look how wonderful Jesus is. But the subtext, don't let others think there's something else. Don't let others drift away. Don't you drift away either. Keep to the first things, the main things, the important things. There's no higher spirituality than what we find in Christ. There is salvation in no other. So we focused on the first things, and Peter does this here too, just as Paul did. Verse 3, knowing this, first of all, scoffers will come in the last day with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Why does he say first of all? Because you shouldn't be surprised don't forget, Jesus is coming back, but don't forget there's an enemy. Scoffer's going to scoff. Hater's going to hate. Well, that's what they do. Jesus himself said, in these days, the faith of some will wax cold. There are always scoffers. What did Satan say to Eve when he was tempting her? He said, did God really say this? God didn't really say this. What is that? There's a doubt. And then there was the scoffing. Oh, surely not. You're not going to die. There'll be no death for you. God's holding out on you. God was not holding out. Instead, God was holding forth life, and he still holds forth life in Christ it says that these scoffers lose their faith. They lose the faith because of their sinful desires. How often is this the case? You find someone who is no longer going to affirm the doctrines of the scripture, but it wasn't because they had some teaching that now is, it can be sometimes. Maybe they've been beguiled by some new logic or some new teaching or some new reasoning, but most of the time it's because there's sin in their life and they want to cover it over. Different sin. This is my own experiences. I've seen people who've gone away. The reason they've gone away was not because of some intellectual thing. It was because of sin that they had in their life. They were not being faithful to a spouse. They were throwing off the ways of righteousness. Or maybe it's just greed or plain old pride. They want to have their own way. They want to rule their own way. They think very highly of themselves. That's always the case with a scoffer. They think highly of themselves, and they think better of themselves than they think of you. I mean, after all, I'm going to scoff at you because I'm better than you. That's why we shouldn't be scoffers. Even with those who are wrong, our entreaties are not to be with that sneer. 
but with the love of the gospel and the truth of the gospel. Scoffer will scoff. They want to make you look smaller so they can make themselves look bigger. Do we read warnings about the scoffer in the scripture? Oh, we sure do. Read the book of Proverbs. Lots of them in there. Or how about the very first psalm? Blesses a man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of the, the sinner or sit in the seat of the scornful. Sit in the seat of the scoffers. When you are hanging out and following the counsel and advice of the ungodly, you're on the wrong way. And if you stop and you hang around, you stand with the sinners and start to do that, you'll do the wrong thing. When you sit down and camp out with the scoffers, guess what happens to you? You start scoffing. Don't do that. You want to be the blessed man. Well, what's the blessed man do? He doesn't have time for that. His heart is... His mind is on the word of God. He meditates on these. That's a theme in scripture. Keep the word in your mouth. Keep it in your mind. Let it stir you up to do the right things. And these protect you from the words of the scoffers. Specifically, the scoffing talked about here is about the promise of the return of Jesus. Verse 4. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Nothing really changes. Sun comes up in the east. It sets in the west. Next day, same thing. Okay, it gets a little cooler. And then it gets a little warmer. The days get longer, the days get shorter, but they go. People are born, people are married, people are born, people grow old, people die, nothing really changes. A generation goes. Jesus said he's coming back, but what indication do we see of this? Now, Jesus actually already answered this taunt. He answered this taunt when he taught the disciples what to expect. This is from Luke's, Luke 17, verse 26. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will be the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. He goes on. Likewise, as in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building but on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, there's nothing wrong with eating and drinking and marrying and giving marriage and building. And what else were they doing there? Planting and all these things. This is what we do. But what he's saying is they were carrying on business as normal. Nothing's ever going to change. I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm in charge of what's going on here. There's not going to be a judgment of God coming. So they say, and they believe that all the way until the day the judgment happened. As they saw it coming. Peter probably has this very words of Jesus in his mind because this is what he alludes to as well. Judgment comes with finality to those not in the ark. Judgment came on Sodom and everyone who stayed in there. They had no reason to think that judgment day was the next day. Even though there were examples and, and things they should have understood, they had opportunity to repent all the way up to that day but they were swept away. Here's some questions to think about. Are there days, times, things we can see in the Bible when there is indication that judgment is coming and there's a strong, strong warning? The answer is, we see some. The grace of God gives extra reason to repent. Jonah's message when he goes to Nineveh, 40 days and you will be destroyed. That doesn't sound like a gospel invitation to me. That sounds like an announcement that they might as well start digging their own graves. And as far as Jonah was concerned, that's what he hoped would happen. 
40 days and you'll be destroyed. And the people repented with sackcloth and ashes from the lowest to the greatest. All of them. And the Lord spared them. There was at Belshazzar's feast in Daniel, handwriting on the wall that came, you know, mene, mene, tikulu farsen, uh, measured, measured, weighed, and found wanting. There's the judgment of God. What does this mean? They brought Daniel out. Well, he understands these things. Daniel said, well, uh, you're being overtaken now. Like, this is it. And they wanted to give him, you know, here's a special, special new uh, honor here. You know, gold neck, a chain for your neck and a special position in the kingdom. And he goes, uh, no, no, uh, that's not going to mean anything. Uh, give it to someone else if you like. It's tonight. It happens. Well, was there anyone else who repented? One wonders. Because Daniel survived one regime after another. And this is not an election. This is a conquering army. They recognize that. Might there have been others? We don't know. There might have been. The city of Jerusalem was destroyed. Jesus told that that was coming. Did anyone get saved from that? The answer is yes. You know, when you see this coming, don't dilly-dally. Get out of town. And the Christians did. They fled as the master had directed. Where there is specific things, there is specific opportunity to repent. But that doesn't mean people will. And often there is no extra thing that's given to give a warning. It happens with people. Someone may have a close encounter with death and they begin to think. Or they have something else that they begin to think. I saw something, this fellow, he was about 40, and he, uh, he said that he was, he was in the operating room, and they have this grave look, and he overhears one nurse saying, well, he could have a heart attack during the surgery. And he's thinking, oh, no. So he says, I can't control whether I'm going to wake up, but I'm going to pray. And he did wake up, and he says, you know, I need to make some life changes. We can be that way. And he says, anybody else want to be with me? We're going to try to get healthier and, and put things away that aren't, aren't good for us. Good for him. But oftentimes things happen and people don't really take that to heart at all. Jesus tells of a rich man who had a poor man named Lazarus nearby. And you know this that our Lord told and the, the rich man had everything he needed. The poor man barely had scraps. The dogs came and licked his sores. When he died, he was in a place of paradise, Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died and was in a place of torment. He was not acting righteously as God would have had him act. And he cries out to Abraham, Oh, Father Abraham, uh, could you at least send Lazarus to... To, to, to put a little water on my tongue, I'm just in agony here. Anything would help. He says, no, great distance between us, won't happen. He says, well, can you, could you send me back? I've got five brothers. They're all as bad as I am. They're all going to wind up here. They all need to be warned. And the response was, they had Moses and the prophets just like you did. He says, well, but if someone rises from the dead, they'll believe. And the response, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe even if someone rises from the dead. There's some irony in this because our Lord rose from the dead and some still didn't believe. Can you imagine someone comes back from the dead? Well, that's not really him. If they're not going to listen to what God's already given, they're not going to respond even with something more. Scoffers. Scoffers will scoff. Jesus isn't coming back, they say. They are like the unrighteous servant who the master leaves them and leaves them in charge, and they begin to think, well, he's never coming back. I'm going to start to eat the good food. I'm going to beat the others. I'm going to mistreat other people. One day is just like another. 
I'm now the king. I'm now the one in charge. I'm the master. And what happens? He forgot about the master, but the master came back and there was a reckoning. Scoffers will be judged in the reckoning that's coming for them. And Peter says if they really looked and saw what happened in the past, they could see that there's reason to believe Jesus when he said he's coming back. Verse 5, these scoffers, they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. The world didn't always exist. It had a beginning. It started. It was created. And what created the world? It was the word of God. There's a beginning by God's will. Why do we think there's not going to be an ending by God's will when he says there's going to be an ending according to the foreordination of God? And then Peter directly mentions the time of judgment, particularly the great flood. Verse 6, that by means of these, right, the water and the word, that the world then existed was deluged with water and perished. They were eating and they were drinking and they were marrying and giving in marriage right up until the time that Noah entered the ark. And they had a warning sign that something was up. Noah built the ark for 100 years. What you doing, Noah? I'm building an ark. Why are you building an ark? God told me to build an ark. There's going to be judgment. They saw that place of refuge, but they paid it no mind. And then they saw animals starting to come to the ark. Well, then that's something. They still paid it no mind. Must have caused some speculation, but no. They scoffed as scoffers do. Where's the promise of his coming? It's another day. It's just like the last one. But they were mistaken because the next day and the next 40 was going to be very different as the water came down and as they're covered. That was their last day. The biggest difference for the post-flood world for the scoffers was they would not be in it. The great judgment of the flood, though, does have a beautiful promise There's the rainbow that says, never again, the Lord says, he make this promise, will I destroy the earth by flood. And yet that does not mean that there would be no destruction and judgment on the earth. There would be. Although not by flood, but by fire. Verse 7. By the same word, the heavens and the earth that are now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Judgment is coming on wickedness. Judgment is coming at a time they don't expect. So we should be watching and waiting. So what do you do when you hear the scoffer? You could be discouraged. God is coming back. He is going to come to take his own. The Lord himself is coming. Again, Psalm 1. Don't listen to them. Don't sit with them. Don't dwell with them and have all their ways. Give your heart and your time to those who are going to encourage you with things in the word of God. That's how the blessed man lives. His delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. And so he is going to be rooted like that tree planted by the water to bring fruit in his season. You know, his leaf doesn't wither. Whatever he does will prosper. Ungodly, not so much. No, not at all. Not so the ungodly. Second, don't think that your main task with the scoffer is to correct them and to engage them in debate. You can, of course. You should talk with them. You should give the reason for the hope that you have when they ask you, and you should recognize even when they're asking you, that you give this, and you pray for them. But they may not be open to it. That's what you do 
but your, their conversion is not ultimately up to you. The enemy wants you to stumble. If the enemy can tie you up, take away your focus, the enemy can make you stumble. Paul speaks several places. Titus, for one, he says, you know, you talk to these folks and they're all about these genealogies and things that don't matter. So you can talk with them a time or two, but after that, no, no. Don't waste your time doing that. Look at the scoffer. You hear what they say. You tell them the truth. You speak the truth in love. But that's not everything you're to do, to be wrapped up in that. Peter writes here to remind the faithful, focus on the things of the faith. Focus on what is true, not on the scoffer's taunts. It's not that Peter and Paul wouldn't debate and challenge unbelievers and scoffers, or that we shouldn't either. But what we have here is not a manual for apologetics. If they have this argument, we give that argument. If you have this argument, no. We have a manual that tells us who the Lord Jesus is, and we focus on that, and we're rooted on that. And encourage the faithful to remain faithful. Encourage the faithful that they are not to be sidetracked by the godless. So do these scoffers belittle you? Yes. Do they sneer at you? Well, yes. Where is the Lord, the Lord's proclaims going to happen to these people? Oh, it's not good. They'll be destroyed. Robert Burns has a poem. Robert Burns was a bit of a scoundrel himself. But in that, there's a warning. He says, the atheist laugh is a poor exchange for a deity offended. Watch your tongue, young man. Watch your tongue, not so young man. Why do we care what the scoffer says? Are they going to give us eternal life? They're not offering anything more than anybody else does. Nothing of note. But we do seem to care what other people think, don't we? One of our study, study small groups just start, finished a book of Ed Welch's call, When People Are Big and God is Small. When people are big, we worry about what people think. And when God is small, we're not concerned what God thinks. And if God is big, and God is big, we just forget the basics. We lose the plot. What God thinks is what's important, not what someone else thinks. Why do we fear people? Well, their power, their rejection, their ridicule doesn't feel good. What's the answer to this? Placate them? No. The answer to this is to fear God. Jesus says, don't fear those who can even kill you if they can't send your soul to hell. The person you need to really be concerned about is the one who can destroy body and soul in hell. And that's the Lord. The Lord is over all of these things. The Lord is the one we are to please. When you realize how big the Almighty is, human beings, what can they do in comparison? Don't feel those who can kill the body if that's all they can do. But we do fear the Lord. We pay attention to what God has to say. Again, remember, stir up your mind. Put this in your mind. You remember the predictions knowing these things, keep them there. This is life. When you think of that, the voice of the scoffer doesn't become very big. We listen to the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we are encouraged as we consider your greatness. You have told us of your love for us. Others might scoff, others might wonder, but you've shown us that love in Christ and you've given us eyes to perceive it and to embrace it. Lord, fill us up with that understanding, your presence and your joy. Yes, those who don't know, they do not understand. We even call out, taste and see that the Lord is good, but they don't taste, they don't see. Lord, we ask that you would be gracious to our loved ones who don't know the Lord to bring them into repentance, to bring them into faith. 
But we pray, too, that you would give us an opportunity and a desire to love the first things first, to hold on to that which is true, that we not be upended by what others would try to do to pull us away from you. Lord, I do thank you for your word. It's so real. And it identifies who we are. This week, guide our conversations. Give us eyes to look with clarity as we understand you and your purposes, even as we look with love and compassion on those who don't know you. Lord, cause us to look not with jeering or sneering as they may, or with, nor with fear, but to look with compassion, trusting in you who are faithful. In this we thank you and pray in Jesus' name.